In February of 1985, Maria Gonzalez would be very relieved when her employers got back from their vacation in Europe. The 58-year-old live-in maid and all-around family companion looked up at the big house in the heart of Houston, Texas, where she had been employed for the last five years, ever since September of 1977. Maria's friendly brown eyes softened at the sight of the two little boys watching her from a downstairs window as she walked back into the mansion on Memorial Drive, carrying the morning newspaper. The paper was in English, so Maria, whose first language was Spanish, hardly gave it a glance before placing it neatly on top of the growing pile of newspapers in the home office of her employer, Houston lawyer James Campbell. Mr. Campbell and his wife, Virginia, had been gone almost two weeks now, and Maria had, as always, loved the time she had spent with the couple's two grandsons, eight-year-old Michael and six-year-old Matthew. Maria and the boys had both arrived at 8901 Memorial Drive at nearly the same time. That was when Cindy, one of the Campbell's four daughters, had come back home to her parents following a divorce. Maria let out a sigh. Her feelings towards Cindy were a lot less warm than her feelings for the rest of the Campbell family. It had all happened 10 years ago, before Maria had joined the family, but everyone knew the story. In 1972, Cindy had run off to Colorado at the age of 17, and once she was there, she met and married a man named Michael Charles Ray. But right after her two boys were born, Cindy wanted out of the marriage, and her father had arranged the divorce, making sure that Cindy got full and exclusive custody of her kids. But then all Cindy had done was bring the boys back to the family home on Memorial Drive and hand them over to her parents to raise. And by the time Maria had arrived to help with the house and the boys, Michael and Matthew were both calling their grandparents mom and dad. And Cindy was living at her parents' expense in an apartment building that was part of the Campbell's various real estate holdings in and around Houston. And when Cindy did visit, it seemed to Maria that the second to youngest Campbell daughter was much more interested in getting money from her mom and dad than she was in spending any time with her own two kids. As Maria herded Michael and Matthew into the kitchen to make them a nice hot breakfast, the three of them chatted away in Spanish. Thanks to Maria, the boys were fluent in both Spanish and English, and now that they were getting a little older, they were also doing their best to help Maria brush up on her English skills. As Maria watched them settle down at the scuffed kitchen table to eat their scrambled eggs dotted with bright jalapeno and sweet red peppers, she had to admit that it was probably better that Cindy was not actively involved in her children's lives. From her apartment over the garage, where she'd had a bird's eye view of the Campbell household for five years now, it had seemed to Maria that Cindy mostly seemed to create problems for other people. During the few years that Cindy was going to the same college as her younger sister Jamie, Maria had seen Cindy get into the car with Jamie in the morning to drive to school, and as soon as Jamie had started up the car and headed down the driveway to the street, Maria had seen Cindy toss burning cigarette butts into Jamie's long hair. And not only had Cindy never gotten her own driver's license, as far as Maria knew, she'd never really had a job either, not even after she had dropped out of college and had a lot of time on her hands. There had been that time, maybe a year or a year and a half ago, when Cindy had lived with a boyfriend who had helped her eat better and even go for walks and do some exercising, and Cindy had not only lost close to 60 pounds, but she'd also told her family that she'd gotten a job at a Houston nightclub doing stand-up comedy. But, like most of Cindy's so-called fresh starts, that had not amounted to much. Because now, Cindy was back to living in squalor in her own apartment again. Maria had heard what the apartment looked like. Unwashed dishes, open cans of partly eaten food, dirty sheets on an unmade bed. And it looked to Maria like Cindy had given up on exercise, along with keeping herself clean and going to work. And lately, with her parents still not due back in town for another few days, Cindy had started to drop by the mansion again, getting lifts with people Maria did not know or recognize, and who just tended to sit in their car and smoke or drop an empty soda or beer can out of the car window while they waited for Cindy to come back outside. One of the reasons the Campbells had decided to go on this vacation in the first place was to get away from Cindy. In the last six months, Mr. Campbell especially had gotten fed up with Cindy's tantrums and requests for money, and he had told her that it was way beyond the time that she had found a job and started supporting herself. 
Mrs. Campbell still found it hard to say no to Cindy, but Maria knew that even Cindy's mother had finally run out of patience. And ever since her parents had turned off the money faucet, it seemed to Maria that Cindy was always in a very bad mood. Yes, Maria thought, as she and the boys all squeezed themselves onto the worn couch in the living room to watch a little TV, Maria would be very glad when Mr. and Mrs. Campbell arrived back home. It had made Maria uneasy hearing Cindy clomping through the house. Maria was a very strong and capable woman, but she had decided that she would rather not be alone at the house when Cindy stopped by for those visits. But a few nights later, on June 9th, 1982, when Maria opened the big front door of the brick and flagstone house to welcome the Campbells back home from their vacation, the housekeeper could see immediately that just stepping over the threshold back into their own home seemed to deepen the lines of worry around Virginia Campbell's intensely blue eyes. 50 years old and 5 foot 4 inches tall, Virginia's trim frame had gotten shorter over the years because of a slight curvature of her spine and the three decades she'd spent as a paralegal hunched over a keyboard. Now the top of her head barely reached her husband's shoulders. But even though she was tired from all the traveling, Virginia gave Maria a warm smile. Over the years, the two women had become friends, as well as employer and housekeeper, and they had shared a bond in their love for Michael and Matthew. Maria appreciated Virginia's sense of humor, and she liked that her employer did not show off her wealth with expensive and fussy furniture. Despite its size, the inside of the Campbell's house was comfortable and plain. Mr. Campbell sometimes accepted TVs and other appliances in place of payment from his clients, and inside the living room, there were two TVs, one stacked on top of the other. There wasn't very much that was fancy about Virginia, either. She was a hard worker, she enjoyed wearing inexpensive costume jewelry, and if Maria could find one fault with her employer, it was that Virginia was maybe overly generous with everybody and maybe a little too timid when it came to speaking her mind. The same could never be said of Mr. Campbell. Six foot four inches tall, 201 pounds with a strong build and dark hair and features, James Campbell, who was 55 years old, had made a name for himself as a highly skilled and successful Houston lawyer with a solo practice and a sly and unpredictable sense of humor. He was well known not just for winning cases, but for his courtroom theatrics. With his trademark Panama hat with its wide brim and his slightly rumpled suits, he was delighted when lawyers for insurance companies underestimated his ability to collect money on behalf of his clients for physical or mental or emotional injuries. He was also a devoted husband and family man. He and Virginia had met when they were both in college in Los Angeles, California, and they had been together ever since. James regularly fired difficult clients and refused huge cases that would take up too much of his time. The Campbells seldom drank or entertained, although they did have a circle of close friends that they liked to spend time with. James's only exercise was playing golf, and most of the time that he was out on the green, he was chewing one of his favorite brands of cigars. Now, even though the couple worked together in James's law office, both James and Virginia were thinking about retirement. In the last year, Virginia had had a health scare. She discovered a lump in her breast, and even though it turned out not to be cancer, it had reminded her and James that there was more to life than just the practice of the law. And even though the couple had done well for themselves financially, if they were going to retire, then they wanted to cut back on unnecessary expenditures, like continuing to support their 27-year-old daughter, Cindy. So, while their vacation was a welcome break for James and Virginia, it hadn't really done anything to solve the family's Cindy problem or change the resentment Cindy was feeling about her parents' decision to finally push her out of the nest. One look at Virginia's tired face and Maria decided not to even mention Cindy's recent visit to the house while her parents were away. But Cindy herself had no intention of protecting her mother from worry. Instead, she seemed eager to make sure that her mother was as miserable as possible. Two days after the Campbells had returned from their vacation, and while James was at his law office, Cindy had arrived at the mansion on Memorial Drive and yelled and screamed at her mother demanding more money. By that afternoon, Cindy not only had more money, she was dragging her mother around Houston to buy Cindy expensive silk blouses and designer jeans. The next day, June 12th, 
Michael and Matthew were waiting for Maria when she came into the main house first thing in the morning. The boys cried when they told Maria about the big fight late the night before between Virginia, who they called mom, and their biological mother, who they just called Cindy, that had occurred when Virginia gave Cindy a ride back to her apartment with all her shopping bags full of new clothes. Maria calmed the boys down as best as she could, but it was clear to Maria that Virginia Campbell was just too timid to stick up for herself. Maria wished that the other Campbell daughters lived closer so they could come by and visit and make Mr. and Mrs. Campbell and the boys smile again. On June 17th, the Campbell's youngest daughter, Jamie, who had left Houston to attend a college out in Knoxville, Tennessee, called to check in on her mom. Now that it was spring, Jamie was hoping to plan a long vacation back at home in Houston. But when Jamie mentioned this plan to her mother on the phone, Virginia just changed the subject. And more and more, Jamie had the feeling that her parents just wanted her to stay right where she was in Knoxville rather than come back to the family home. The next day, Friday, June 18th, was hot and humid. But the spring flowers were in bloom, and the Campbells, including Maria, were all looking forward to an evening out at Houston's Memorial City Mall. And while Virginia did look delighted as she and Maria and Matthew strolled from shop to shop, with Virginia buying small gifts for each of them, when the three of them sat down in the mall cafeteria for a bite to eat, Virginia seemed so anxious and worried that she had no appetite for food. Instead, Virginia just lit one cigarette after another, stubbing each one out after only a few puffs before ordering a Coke and then coffee. By the time they got home around 9 p.m. that evening, James and his older grandson, Michael, had already returned from their evening out, and now James had stretched out his long legs in the living room and was watching TV. Watching as Virginia joined her husband, Maria smiled before walking upstairs to check on the two boys and get them settled for bed. Friday nights were a special treat for Michael and Matthew. That was the one night of the week when they were allowed to drag their sleeping bags and bedding into their grandparents' master bedroom for a sleepover. That involved arranging themselves at the foot of their grandparents' bed and watching a movie on a cassette tape before falling asleep. Maria glanced at her watch. It was almost 9.30 p.m. She helped the boys get comfortable in their sleeping bags at the foot of the bed, and as she kissed them goodnight, she told them that their grandfather would be up any minute to start the movie. A few minutes later, after stopping by the living room to say goodnight to James and Virginia, Maria made her way out the back door to her own apartment over the garage. As she climbed the wooden stairs and looked up at the big Texas sky, Maria shook her head, wishing there was more she could do to help Mrs. Campbell. At about 3.40 a.m. on June 19th, less than six hours after Maria had left the main house to return to her apartment, Maria was startled awake by the sound of small footsteps running up her outside stairs, and then the sound of small hands banging on her door. A moment later, Maria heard the frantic and terrified wails of Michael and Matthew as they begged her to let them inside. After stumbling out of her bedroom and opening the door, it took Maria another moment to understand what Michael and Matthew were telling her. As she leaned down to gather the boys into her arms, the oldest pulled on her nightgown and looked up at her, tears running down his face. And now he was practically screaming as he told Maria in Spanish that mom and dad, aka James and Virginia, were dead. They just killed them! They just killed them! The little boy kept repeating. And then, Maria, please call the hospital! Call an ambulance! At first, Maria believed the boys, both of them, had just had a terrible nightmare, but even as she offered to make them some sugar water and sit down at the table with them, Maria saw that the boys had wet their pants. This was no bad dream, they told her. This had happened. The boys had been asleep, and then the light came on, and then there were loud noises, and then it was quiet again. And when Michael had finally crawled out of his sleeping bag, climbed to his feet, and looked onto the bed, he had seen that his grandparents, mom and dad, were covered in red, and they were no longer moving. Maria still could not believe it, and she didn't know enough English to tell this fantastical story to the police. So instead of calling 911, Maria told Michael to call his uncle, J.W. Campbell, James Campbell's older brother, who was also a lawyer. 20 minutes later, J.W. and his wife, Brucine, arrived at 8901 Memorial Drive. While J.W. waited in Maria's apartment with the two boys, Brucine and Maria made their way over to the back entrance of the main house and stepped inside through the unlocked kitchen door. A minute later, and the two women were standing in the doorway of the master bedroom, 
and Michael and Matthew had been right. James and Virginia Campbell were dead. By 4.13 a.m., just half an hour after Maria had come suddenly awake, Houston police and medical personnel had arrived on the scene. Two men in uniform told the small group of three adults and two children, who were now huddled in the driveway, to step way back from the house. And Maria and Brucine felt a bolt of fear as they understood what the officers were really saying to them, that the killer might still be in the house. Detectives Michael St. John and his senior partner, Carl Kent, got the call at 4.35 a.m. A big murder out on Memorial Drive in an especially affluent area of Houston known as the Golden Buckle on the Sun Belt. 20 minutes later, the two homicide detectives had arrived at the Campbell home and were met in the back of the house by an officer who told them that police had searched the house and it was empty except for the two victims. Stepping into the downstairs rooms, Detective Kent was surprised at how plain the inside of the house was, but when he stepped into the master bedroom, any thoughts about home decor just vanished, as his mind went blank with shock. As a veteran homicide detective, Carl Kent had seen his share of gruesome murders, but this was his first cold-blooded execution. And the fact that the bodies in front of him were inside one of the safest and richest neighborhoods in Texas made him feel like he was looking at an overdone and grotesque movie set rather than real life. Everywhere he looked, there was blood. It was spattered on the ceiling, it was dripping down the walls and pictures, it was sprayed onto the curtains, and it was soaking into the sheets and mattress where James lay on his back and Virginia lay on her side. Two tan sleeping bags lay in a heap on the floor at the foot of the bed. Detective Kent wondered if the killer had even realized that the Campbell's grandsons and potential witnesses were lying right at the shooter's feet when the shots were fired. Detective Kent left his junior partner and the crime scene techs to do their work. He had already noticed some spent shell casings in the bedroom and a plastic surgical glove in the living room that the killer may have dropped on their way out of the house. But right now, Detective Kent wanted to talk to his first person of interest, James Campbell's brother, J.W., the man Maria had told Michael to call even before calling police. The detective wanted to know why J.W., an able-bodied man, had sent Maria and Brucine into the house to check out a possible murder scene instead of going into the house himself, and why, after getting Michael's frantic call, J.W. hadn't immediately alerted the police before heading over to the Campbell's residence. And when Detective Kent eventually spoke to the Campbell's grandsons about what they had seen, the oldest said what his uncle J.W. had told him to say. I have a right to remain silent. The detective couldn't help but wonder if J.W. had anything he was trying to hide. By late Saturday, three of the Campbell daughters had arrived in Houston and were gathered at Memorial Drive. As the women, the oldest, Michelle, and the youngest, Jamie, followed by the second oldest, Betty, started going through their parents' house to see if anything was missing, they quickly discovered that the police were wrong when they assumed there had been no sign of robbery. While no one had taken the gold watch and diamond ring that Virginia had been wearing, and there was no sign that the house had been ransacked, the daughters and Maria quickly discovered that the fat roll of $100 bills that Virginia had taken with her the previous day on her trip to the mall was missing. The fourth Campbell daughter, Cindy, did not show up at 8901 Memorial Drive until the following afternoon, Sunday, June 20th, a day and a half after she'd been told that her parents were dead. And when Cindy did arrive, she and the man driving her, David West, who was yet another one of her on-again, off-again boyfriends, both looked totally hungover. Investigators had already tracked down Cindy and interviewed both her and David. While police were still checking out their alibis, they both seemed pretty solid. David had driven Cindy to her parents' house at about 10 p.m. on the night of June 18th to get some money from her mom, and David had waited in the car. After that, Cindy and David spent the night going out to eat, then attending two different parties where they were seen by multiple witnesses before ending the night at David's house well past the time when the Campbells were murdered. And even though Detective Kent and other investigators would hear plenty of stories about the fights Cindy had with her parents over money, 
police could find nothing in her background or David's to suggest that they could be tied to the murder. As for the other sisters, and James's brother, J.W. Campbell, it would turn out that all of them, too, had solid alibis. And that was the problem. From the very start of the investigation, detectives were hampered by the lack of any useful physical evidence they had collected from the crime scene. They had discovered shell casings along with silver-tipped bullets, a kind of ammunition favored by professional shooters, but there was no murder weapon. They had discovered the point of entry into the Campbell's house, a downstairs den window that had been left unlocked, and in front of the window, a sofa that Maria told them had been pushed out of its usual place under the window. Outside the window, they found footprints that looked like they belonged to a pair of men's boots, along with a few cigarette butts, and inside the house, they had found that single blue surgical glove that the killer must have dropped on their way out of the house. Today, crime techs would have been able to run DNA tests on the cigarette butts and inside of the surgical glove, but back in 1982, the only forensic tool police had were fingerprint tests, and the killer, who appeared to have worn gloves during the attack, had not left any prints at the scene. But even without any solid leads, police continued the slow process of investigating every other clue they could find. They interviewed James Campbell's clients and anyone else whose name came up as someone James had crossed in a court case. They also tracked down Cindy's ex-husband and the father of her children, Michael and Matthew. But it turned out that in addition to having an alibi himself, the boy's biological father had no interest in getting custody of the boys. The same was true of Cindy. On June 23rd, the day after her parents' funeral, Cindy had arrived at the house to take Michael and Matthew home with her. Over the objections of both Maria and the children and her sisters, Cindy had marched out with Michael and Matthew. But less than a week later, she had given up completely on parenthood. Police got a call from the DePelchin Children's Center and Adoption Agency saying that Cindy Campbell had just turned her two young boys over to the center. After police went to the orphanage and retrieved the children, the Campbells decided that the safest place now for Matthew and Michael was to stay in the care of their uncle, J.W., a lawyer, and his wife, Brucine. Over the next four months, the Houston police racked up so much overtime investigating the Campbell murder that they could only put in for half of it and still expect to get paid. They followed up on tips that the mafia might be involved. They followed tips from a prison inmate bragging about slitting the throats of some rich couple in Houston. And because Cindy's three sisters had zeroed in on Cindy as their prime suspect, the police did spot surveillance checks on Cindy and on David, even though the couple seemed to have broken up and gone their own separate ways. But even as the investigation slowly sputtered to a halt, the family drama among the Campbell sisters was just swinging into high gear. Cindy wanted her parents' house sold and the estate settled right away so she could get her share of her parents' money. But it turned out that most of the Campbell's wealth was tied up in real estate, not cash or stocks or bonds, and Cindy's sisters wanted to hold off on selling the house or other real estate holdings until the market improved and they could get a better price. And while investigators were eager for any new evidence, the frequent calls they were now getting from Betty and Jamie insisting that their sister, Cindy, had to be guilty of something had started to sound more and more unreliable, like detectives were just hearing the same old lines from a long-running and distorted family argument. By the end of October 1982, almost five months after James and Virginia were shot in their own bedroom, investigators quietly shelved the Campbell murder case. There were a lot of other homicides in the huge city of Houston that were just as important and a lot easier to solve. It wouldn't be until February 1985, more than two years after the murder of James and Virginia Campbell, that investigators would finally get the tip they were hoping for. And when that call came in, the story police heard was so unbelievable that not only would it make detectives yank that cold case right off the shelf, it would also put the Campbell homicide case onto the front pages of national newspapers from Washington, D.C. to Los Angeles, California. Based on that big tip and follow-up work by police, here is a reconstruction of what really happened in the early morning hours of June 19, 1982 at the Big Brick House on 8901 Memorial Drive in one of Houston's most affluent neighborhoods. 
At 2.30 a.m. on Saturday, June 18th, the Campbell's killer cleaned the 45 caliber pistol one more time before sliding the magazine of silver tip bullets inside. By 3 a.m., the killer had inspected the rest of the gear, smeared mud on the license plate of the car they'd be driving so no one could read all the numbers, and slipped on a tight-fitting pair of plastic surgical gloves. Then the killer slid behind the car's steering wheel and eased out onto the main road that led west to Memorial Drive and the Campbell House. As the killer neared the Campbell Street, they turned off their headlights and pulled their car onto the shoulder of the road on the opposite side of the hulking brick and stone house with the red tile roof. The time was 3.20 a.m. The 45 was tucked into the killer's shoulder holster, and a white hockey mask that goalies wore to protect their entire face fits snugly over the black ski mask underneath. Crossing the road to the front gate that blocked the entrance to the Campbell's property, the killer, careful not to make any noise, unwound a heavy metal chain that was wrapped, but not locked, around the latch. Stepping to the rear wall of the house, the killer found the window that looked in on the den. After easing the screen out, they began to work the window until it slid up just far enough that the killer could slip inside the house. A moment later, after pushing aside a sofa that had been under the window, the killer had crossed the den and then the living room, headed for the curved stairway to the second floor. Before placing their boots soundlessly on the first tread, the killer gently released the safety on the 45 caliber pistol in the shoulder holster. At the landing, the killer paused to listen. The big house was quiet. Turning to the upstairs hallway that was faintly lit by a nightlight plugged into an electrical outlet in the woodwork, the killer went up the last few steps to the second floor. Ignoring the closed doors on either side of the hallway ahead, the killer stopped at the first door on the right. They reached out a gloved hand and slowly turned the knob, pushing the door to the master bedroom open just an inch at a time. Stepping into the room, the killer saw that the queen-sized bed was positioned, so the headboard was to the killer's right. The killer could just make out the figures of James and Virginia Campbell asleep on top of the covers. The killer slipped their hand upwards along the inside wall to the light switch. Taking a slow and steady breath, they flipped on the light and then took two steps forward towards the end of the bed. James rolled over onto his right side and started to bring his left arm up towards his face. The first bullet hit him in the neck. The killer immediately shifted their sights and aimed at Virginia. As the killer pulled the trigger again, Virginia moved slightly and the first bullet grazed her upper arm. Quickly, the killer moved their weapon back to the man and the third round struck James Campbell in his left eye. The fourth shot hit Virginia in her head. Stepping closer to the bed, the killer fired two more rounds, one into each of the victim's chests. Breathing hard, the killer took in the spray of blood across the headboard wall and ceiling. Then the killer looked down one more time to make sure that the Campbells were dead. All of 12 seconds had passed since the killer had switched on the light. Turning, the killer ran out of the room, down the curved stairway, through the living room, and out onto the front yard. The killer had never even noticed that upstairs in the master bedroom, inside of the heap of bedding at the foot of the bed, lay two small boys. 20 or 30 feet from the house, the killer suddenly stopped. Looking around and then swearing softly to themselves, the killer turned and went back to the house. The killer saw her at once, crouched on the living room floor in the dark, patting her hands over the rug, looking for the blue surgical glove she had dropped. Even without her black ski mask on, with her hair tucked inside of the man's hat and dressed in a man's coat and boots, it would have been hard for anyone to recognize the figure as Cindy Campbell. Sweating under the hockey mask and his hooded field jacket, David West grabbed Cindy's arm and pulled her to her feet. Come on, he told her, let's go. A few seconds later, they were both back inside of the car to Buffalo Bayou, a marshy body of water in Houston, where they would get rid of everything that could connect them to the murders they had just committed. The plot to kill James and Virginia Campbell started to take form two years earlier, back in the fall of 1980. That's when a 22-year-old ex-Marine named David Duval West first met Cindy Campbell. The meeting happened totally by chance at the student center at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, where Cindy and her younger sister, Jamie, were both students. David was not a student, but he sometimes came to the Crooker Student Center to eat lunch. 
The two sisters were sitting there together one fall afternoon when David walked in and, recognizing Jamie as a girl he had once dated, walked over to their table to say hello. When Jamie introduced David to her older sister, Cindy, at first, David was repelled by Cindy's physical appearance. David only liked women who were slim and attractive in a very conventional way. At 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighing 180 pounds, Cindy, with her stringy brown hair and round face, could hardly have been further from David's ideal. Except that David found himself noticing how long Cindy's eyelashes were and how her hazel eyes had an exotic tilt to them. And the second time he bumped into Cindy a few weeks later, he stopped again to talk. And this time he told her that she could actually be very attractive if she just lost a little weight and tried a little harder with her appearance. A few days later, David got a call from Cindy. She asked David out on a date, and David said yes. When Cindy hung up the phone, she turned to her sister, Jamie, who was sitting in the same room with her at 8901 Memorial Drive, and Cindy said this about David, quote, He's really gross, he looks like a pig, but you know what? He'd be easy to train, end quote. And it would turn out that Cindy was right. David was very easy to train. By the spring of 1981, Cindy had dropped out of college and had been living with David for six months. He'd put her on a diet and prescribed a regular regimen of exercise, and Cindy had lost 50 pounds. She still wasn't interested in getting a job, but David was so proud of how successfully he was managing Cindy's weight and appearance that he didn't mind supporting her. And now, everywhere they went, men admired Cindy. And Cindy had decided to take a gig as a stand-up comic at the bar where David worked as a bartender. But even as David congratulated himself on having created his own perfect woman, Cindy was busy drawing David into a tangled web of lies. According to Cindy, she had been relentlessly and continually abused ever since she was a child by her parents, by her sisters, by her first husband, and by every boyfriend she had ever had. She had been hit, pinched, tripped, beaten, cut, neglected, and humiliated in every way imaginable. But, according to Cindy, the worst thing that had ever happened to her was getting sexually molested by her father. For weeks, and then months, Cindy talked non-stop to David about the abuse she had suffered, until finally, David agreed with Cindy that both her parents were such horrible human beings that they deserved to die. And when they did die, Cindy, who had been supported by James and Virginia her whole life, would no longer have to ask for money. Instead, her parents' money would simply become her money in the form of her inheritance. What David had no way of knowing was that Cindy told any person she became close to about being horribly abused. But depending on her audience, the type of abuse and the names of the abusers would change. As for her charge that her father had committed incest, she was just as likely to tell people that she herself was illegitimate and that James wasn't her father at all. Sometimes it was Michael James was supposed to have fathered, other times it was Matthew, and other times the father of both sons was her no-good ex-husband Michael Ray. The point of Cindy's stories, none of which police were ever able to substantiate, seemed to be so she could manipulate people and play on their sympathy to get money, and persuade them to take care of her and feed her and invite her into their homes. Even after Cindy left David and moved on to other boyfriends, she always popped into David's life either to rekindle their sexual relationship or ask for some kind of help, and each time she made sure she reminded him about what she claimed her father had done to her. And by early spring 1982, when James and Virginia decided it was time for their daughter Cindy to go get a job, Cindy returned to David, and when she did, it was to tell him that suddenly her father had started making inappropriate advances towards her, and Cindy wanted David to kill both James and Virginia Campbell. So, while James and Virginia began planning their trip to Europe with a return date of June 9th, David and Cindy began to plan exactly how they were going to kill them. And by the evening of June 19th, David and Cindy were ready to put their plan into action. Weeks earlier, David had picked up a Combat Commander 45 caliber pistol from one of his friends, and he'd been going to a local shooting range to brush up on the marksmanship skills he had learned in the Marines. 
He'd also bought jackets, coats, ski masks, and boots for himself and Cindy, so even if anyone saw them, no one would recognize them. While her parents were in Europe, Cindy started dropping by the house on Memorial Drive. Not only did she help herself to towels and food, she also began trying the downstairs windows to see which one opened with the least amount of noise and effort. On the evening of June 18th, one hour after Cindy's parents and Cindy's sons and Maria had all returned from their evening out on the town, David drove Cindy to her parents' house at 10 p.m. so Cindy could get some cash from her mother. But the real purpose of that visit was to unlock the window in the den so when Cindy and David came back at 3.30 in the morning to kill Cindy's parents, they would have a way to get inside the house. After that short visit to 8901 Memorial Drive, Cindy and David carefully set up an alibi, making sure they were seen at several parties that were too big for anyone to remember exactly when they left, only that they were there. And then, at 3.20 a.m., dressed to kill, David pulled the car they were driving up onto the shoulder of the road directly across from the Campbell's mansion. And when David slid into the Campbell's house through the den window that Cindy had left unlocked, Cindy was right behind him, and it was Cindy who led David up the stairs to her parents' bedroom, and it was Cindy who flipped on the lights just before racing back downstairs where she dropped that blue glove to wait for David. And for months after the murders, it looked like David and Cindy may have committed the perfect crime. They only had one moment of panic when they realized that Cindy's boys were actually in the Campbell's bedroom when the murders were committed and might be able to ID them. That's when Cindy dragged the children out of the Campbell home on June 23rd and took them to David's apartment where she and David grilled the two little boys about what they had seen or heard on the night of the murders. Satisfied that the boys could not ID them, Cindy and David simply dropped the boys off at the orphanage. Six weeks after the murders, Cindy broke up with David and started borrowing large amounts of money drawn against her expected inheritance. And at the same time, the Houston Homicide Division put the Campbell murder investigation in the cold case files. But then, two years and four months after the murders, and just before Cindy's sisters were ready to settle their parents' estate and distribute the Campbell's inheritance among the four daughters, Cindy's older sister, Betty, decided to make one final attempt to see if Cindy had been involved in their parents' murder. And in December of 1984, Betty hired a private detective firm called Clyde Wilson International Investigators to find out who killed James and Virginia. On the evening of Wednesday, December 19th, David West looked up from his drink at the Park Lane Bar in Houston and saw just this kind of woman weaving her way towards him. Tall, athletic-looking, and plenty of curves, Teresa Neal, as she later introduced herself, was wearing high-heeled suede boots, black satin pants and jacket, and black eyeliner around her big, vivid blue eyes. Two weeks later, and David was totally smitten with her. He was fine with the fact that Teresa wanted to keep things between them platonic, at least for now. David had always prided himself on respecting and defending women, which was really what had gotten him mixed up in Cindy's murder plot in the first place. He'd been trying to protect her from her father. But now, the crime he had committed weighed on David, and by January 4th, he had started dropping hints to Teresa that he was keeping a very big secret. And it had to do with an old girlfriend of his, a woman named Cindy Campbell. By mid-February of 1985, David and Teresa had declared their love for one another. But before Teresa could fully trust David and begin the physical relationship he wanted, he had to tell her the details of this secret he was keeping. He had to be totally honest and open with her before she could commit to him. So, on the night of February 20th, after spending the evening together and listening to David talk about Cindy Campbell's crazy tales of abuse, neglect, and incest, Teresa told him it was now or never. As they sat inside her car in the driveway of his house, Teresa's black purse on the console between them, Teresa told David that if he didn't tell her exactly what he and Cindy had done, then Teresa was going to walk out of his life forever. After a long moment of silence, David reached across the space between them, put his fingers under Teresa's chin, and turned her face so he was looking directly into her blue eyes. Then, in a quiet voice, David told Teresa, quote, I killed both her parents, end quote. 
Teresa, whose real name was Kim Paris, and whose real job was working as an undercover private detective for the firm that Betty had hired to find her parents' killer, let out a long, astonished breath. In all her time working this case, it had never really occurred to the young private eye that David himself might have executed James and Virginia Campbell. Meanwhile, the tape recorder whirring away silently in the purse that sat between them picked up every word of David's confession. And so did the surveillance team in the police van around the corner where Kim's partner was listening with two police officers. Back at the Houston police station, investigators got the call and the tip they had been waiting for. Thanks to the work done by Clyde Wilson International Investigations and 23-year-old Kim Paris, Houston police could finally close the case on the Campbell murders. Before Kim Paris left David's driveway that night, she and David agreed to meet up together the following night for dinner. And on February 21st, after that dinner, during which David gave up even more details about the murder and Cindy's involvement, Kim told David she needed to stop on their way home at a convenience store so she could buy another pack of cigarettes. When they made that stop, Kim told David to wait in the car, saying she'd be back in just a couple of minutes. As soon as she walked away, an entire team of police officers surrounded the car. When David stumbled out of the front passenger seat, he caught sight of Kim standing on the other side of the store's glass windows. As David was arrested and charged with capital murder, Kim met his eyes and raised the beer can she was now holding in a silent toast. Later that same Thursday, Houston police issued an arrest warrant for Cindy Ray Campbell. And on December 11, 1985, David West pleaded guilty to the first-degree murders of James and Virginia Campbell. In exchange for that guilty plea, he did not face the death penalty, and he agreed to testify at trial against his one-time girlfriend, Cindy Campbell. David was immediately sentenced to life in prison. In June of 1987, Cindy was also convicted of first-degree murder and was also sentenced to life in prison. David is still incarcerated today at Ramsey Correctional Center in Brazoria County, Texas. As for Cindy, on September 13th, 2021, while serving her life sentence at Mountain View Women's Prison in Gatesville, Texas, she died of natural causes. She was 65 years old. In the late 1860s, a group of rugged American explorers came out of the wilderness and went straight to a newspaper to tell them about this otherworldly place they had found. And so the newspaper sat down, they got their notepad out, and these explorers start describing this place. And they say, okay, well, it's this huge expanse of wilderness. And in the middle of it, there are all these boiling lakes that are either neon green or yellow or red or all of those. And they're shooting boiling water into the sky. And there are these breathtaking waterfalls and snow-capped mountains. And there are bison and elk and wolves and bears just free roaming the whole area. And so the newspaper, they take all this down, and at the end of it, they say, okay, guys, well, unfortunately, we don't publish fiction. But these explorers weren't lying. They were describing an area that we now know as Yellowstone National Park, which is this massive expanse of wilderness in Wyoming that sits on top of a volcano. And those boiling neon green, red, and yellow lakes really do exist. Those are hot springs, and they are the result of water passing by and making contact with underground magma chambers. Today, Yellowstone is so popular that every year, millions of people go to the park. And so as a result, the park employs hundreds of people year-round to keep up with tourism. Many of these employees are young people, like college students, and in addition to being paid for their work, the park also offers them the ability to live in employee housing, which are basically dormitories spaced all across the park to make it easier to just be on site and do their job, and these dormitories are either free or very low cost. And so these young people typically take up that offer and will stay inside of these dormitories for as long as they're working at the park. And so in 2000, a 20-year-old summer employee named Sarah Hulfers, she was staying in one of these dormitories in the park, and she was in her room, when a group of other young employees that were staying in the storm came down the hall, and they knocked on her door, and they asked her if she wanted to come with them to go swimming. And so Sarah, she had a day off, and she wasn't doing anything, and so she said, sure, I'll come with you guys. And so after they all got their bathing suits on, and got their towels and snacks packed, they left the dormitories and got into a couple of cars, and then they drove over to this dirt lot that was right up against this huge forest. 
And so they parked, they got out, and they make their way over to this trailhead that begins in the parking lot and goes straight into this forest. And so they walk down this trail until the trail goes right out of the forest and brings them to the edge of this river. And this river was called the Firehole River. It was called that because the surface of this river steamed and it gave the impression that this river was on fire. The reason this happened is some of the water flowing through this river would pass by those underground magma chambers, warming it up. And so this is a lot like the hot springs, except on a much smaller level. The hot springs are boiling, whereas this river was just slightly warmer to the point where it would steam. So totally safe to swim in. So Sarah and the rest of this group, they come out of that trailhead and they're standing on the edge of this beautiful river and they walk down to the edge and they all jump in and they have this great day. They're swimming around, they're playing games and they were only expecting to be there for a couple of hours, but they were having so much fun that before long, the sun had gone down and they were still in the river. And so when it was dark out, they finally climbed out of the river and they toweled off and then they realized they had a bit of a problem. Because they did not expect to be there for as long as they were, no one had brought flashlights. And the way back to the parking lot would be going along that trail through the forest, but that was a pretty far trail, and it's totally pitch black out. There's no ambient light, and realistically, there's some pretty big animals that live inside of that forest. And so some people in this group were a little bit nervous about walking through this forest. But ultimately, about half of the group said, you know what, whatever, let's just run through the forest and get back to our cars as fast as we can. I'm sure nothing will happen to us. And the other half decided they would look for an alternative route that would skirt the forest and allow the moonlight to be their guide along the way. That second group was made up of Sarah, along with two 18-year-old boys named Lance Bucci and Tyler Montague. So Sarah and these two boys, they're standing there and they're watching the first group go into the forest and disappear. And then she, along with these two guys, they turn right and they begin skirting the river and walking around the forest. And so they walk downstream with the river on one side and the forest on their left. And they're walking for a while until they see up ahead on their left, it looks like the forest is starting to thin out maybe a little bit. And so they took that as an opportunity to cut left and basically begin kind of going straight towards the parking lot, which was generally off to their left. And so they make that turn, they start walking, and the terrain is relatively open. It's this big open field with a couple of trees here and there. It was pretty easy to navigate, and they felt like, hey, we found a great alternative route. The moonlight's still shining through. We got great visibility. And so they're walking along, happy as can be, and then they see there's a couple of streams up ahead. They get to the first stream, and it's not that big, so they jump across it. They get to the next stream, it's still not that big, they jump across that one. And then they get to this third stream and they realize, you know, it's still pretty small, but it's significantly bigger than the last two. And so if we mistime it, we could fall into it. Now, this was not some huge deal. They were already wet from having gone swimming, but they didn't want to jump in this stream. And so they considered walking off to the right and trying to find an area that was more narrow, they could jump across more easily. But they figured they were probably within maybe one or 200 feet of the parking lot. They couldn't see it, but they knew they were close. And they really didn't want to go farther and farther away to only have to just jump over this thing anyways. And so they decide, you know what? Let's just jump across it. Let's just do it. If we fall in, we fall in. And so the three of them backed up from the stream to give themselves some running room. And then they grabbed hands. And at the same time, all three of them ran forward and leapt across the stream. And they cleared it. They landed on the other side, but the ground they landed on was kind of loose and soft, and so it kind of crumbled underneath them, and they all fell backwards into the stream. In the darkness, this stream had looked like the other two streams they had seen, albeit a little bit larger, and so they were not thinking this could be potentially hazardous if they fell into the water. But it would turn out this stream was extremely hazardous. It was nothing like the other two streams they had encountered. This one was runoff from a nearby hot spring. And so the temperature inside of this stream was 178 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was practically boiling water and it looked like it was shallow. But in fact, this stream was 10 feet deep. And so when this trio fell into these scalding waters, they let out blood-curdling streams, and the other group that had ran down the forest path, 
they had got to the parking lot and were waiting for them. And so they hear this scream and they just take off running in the direction of the screams. They cut right through the forest and they come out to that field and they find Lance and Tyler are on the edge of the stream, desperately trying to pull Sarah out of the water. And so the parking lot crew, they run over and they grab Sarah, they pull her out. They don't really know what's happened. They don't know this is some boiling stream, but it very quickly dawns on them when Lance and Tyler and Sarah just continue to scream outside of the water that something is horribly wrong. And so one of the people in the parking lot crew, they take off running, they go into one of their cars and they drive and they get help. And not that long after a helicopter would arrive and it would take Sarah, Lance and Tyler to a nearby hospital. It would turn out Lance and Tyler, when they fell into this water, they only submerged up to their necks. And as soon as they hit the water, they immediately turned and got themselves out again. So they were only in the water for maybe a second or two. And these things ultimately saved their lives. Although they did still have burns over almost their entire bodies. They had to go through dozens and dozens of surgeries and years of rehab, and they had to pay all this money for medical bills. So it was not a smooth course after they got pulled out, but they lived. As for Sarah, she was not as lucky. When she fell into the water, she completely submerged. Her head, her body, all of it went under the water, and then she just could not get herself out again, and so she stayed in the water much longer than the guys did. When she was admitted to the hospital, despite the fact she was talking and conscious, the doctors very quickly realized they had a big problem with her. A third degree burn or a full thickness burn is when the outer layer of skin gets destroyed and also the inner deeper tissues of the skin also gets destroyed, including the cells that are responsible for reproducing skin. And so if you get a third degree burn, that part of your body will not heal on its own. You literally have to get a skin graft and a skin graft is effectively a skin transplant. They will take other sections of skin from your body that are unburned and they will place them over that site where you have the third degree burn. But when Sarah was wheeled into the operating room, it was determined that she had third degree burns on 100% of her body. So there was no unburned skin to use for a skin graft. Her whole body was ruined. And so despite their best efforts, Sarah would pass away 15 hours after arriving at the hospital. A year later, Lance's family would sue the National Park Service for not having put up a sign near that particular stream to warn people of its dangers. But that lawsuit was tossed out because it was determined that the trio, Sarah, Tyler, and Lance, had chosen to walk off trail in a known thermal area, and so they were being negligent, not the park. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called Magellan. If you hop in a boat just off the coast of Aberdeen, Scotland, and you cruise eastward, after about seven hours, depending on your speed and the weather, you would come across this massive man-made structure jutting up out of the ocean. It looks like a cross between a construction site and a corporate office building sitting on top of 100 foot tall metal stilts. It's called Magellan and it is an offshore oil rig and it will remain in place until all the oil has been sucked up in that area. The people who work, often for weeks or months at a time, on rigs like Magellan are known as roughnecks and they have one of, if not the most, dangerous job in the world. All exterior surfaces on these offshore rigs are always slick, either with water or oil, and so there is a constant risk of falling, sometimes hundreds of feet. If you're up on a higher platform, you could fall to a lower platform, which could be fatal, or you could fall clean off the rig all the way to the ocean 100 plus feet below. If you add in some bad windy weather, the risk of falling increases tenfold. Also, the crude oil that these roughnecks are drilling for is highly combustible, and so fires are a huge concern as well. And if that wasn't risky enough, there's also this phenomenon known as a blowout, where basically the oil well that the drill is actually drilling into will just explode. Now, all rigs have some sort of mitigating equipment to try to save themselves in case this occurs, but in reality, if it happens and you are unfortunately near the drill when it happens, you are likely to be killed or maimed. While the downsides of working on an oil rig are fairly obvious, the upsides are too. Namely, your pay is fantastic. 
In 2000, a 41-year-old father of two named Gordon Moffat was a roughneck working on the Magellan. His primary job was to perform maintenance on the drill. Now, these offshore rigs work great most of the time, but they do have a habit of breaking down fairly often. And for a drilling company, any time they are not sucking out crude oil, they're losing money. And so it was just a known thing when you worked on one of these rigs that as soon as there is an issue that causes the drill to stop working, it must be fixed immediately, whether it's day, night, horrible weather, good weather, it didn't matter, it had to be fixed right away. And so on the night of October 9th that year, Gordon had just gotten back to his quarters to end the day when he got a call on his radio that he was actually needed to come back out to fix a problem that had stopped the drill. Now, Gordon was a seasoned roughneck, and he had grown quite accustomed to these late-night calls to go out and fix things, and so he wasn't annoyed. He just put his stuff back on, turned around, and he headed out the door. When Gordon got to the main deck, which is this wide-open metal platform right in the middle of the rig where the drill actually passes down through it on its way to the ocean, when he got to the main deck, he was met by some of his co-workers who told him where he would need to go. The cabling that needed fixing was located right below the main deck. However, it was not accessible from the main deck. In order for Gordon to get to it, he would need to go down to the next lowest platform from the main deck. Basically, he would need to hop in an elevator and go down one floor. And from this lower deck, the crew on the main deck would lower down a harness attached to a long wire they would feed it down through this hole in the main deck platform called a mouse hole. It was about 10 inches across and they would feed it down and he would grab the harness, he would put it on and then he would signal up to the main deck crew who could literally see him through this mouse hole. They would turn around and they would signal somebody called the hoist operator and they were located above the main deck slightly back. They couldn't actually see Gordon. So they're relying on communications with the people on the main deck and the hoist operator would start their winch. And a winch basically reels in the wire that was connected to the harness that was on Gordon. And so once the hoist operator was informed, he'd turn on the winch, and then Gordon would be raised up until he could access these cables, and then he'd do his maintenance and be lowered back down, and that would be it. Now, Gordon and the crew had done maintenance using this winch system many times before, so this was a very routine fix. So Gordon made his way from the main deck down to the slightly lower deck, and he looked up at the mouse hole, and he watched as the main deck crew members lowered the harness with the wire attached to it down through the mouse hole. And so Gordon grabbed the harness, he put it around his waist, and he secured it. And after he was sure it was on correctly, he signaled up to the crew on the main deck that he was ready to start, and they in turn turned around. They flagged the hoist operator who started the winch. And so very slowly, Gordon was lifted off the platform he was standing on, and he was brought up after several minutes, all the way up about 10 feet to access these cables. And as soon as he was parallel with them, he waved to the main deck crew, who were not far from him at this point, and he said, I'm good. And so they turned around, they told the hoist operator, who stopped the winch. And so Gordon got his tools out and he began working on these cables and the whole time he's trying to stay in one place because the wind is whipping through and he's kind of dangling and swinging around. And then eventually he finishes the repair, the cables are good. And so he signals the crew on the main deck through the mouse hole that he was good to go. You can lower me back down now. And so the main deck crew, they turn, they wave to the hoist operator to go ahead and lower Gordon. And the hoist operator, he gives the thumbs up and he starts the winch. However, the hoist operator accidentally forgot to switch the direction of the winch. And so when he started it again, instead of the winch spooling the wire out and lowering Gordon, it continued to reel the wire in, pulling Gordon upward. Now, the winch did not move very quickly, and so it wasn't like Gordon is rocketing up towards the mouse hole. However, this problem was immediately recognized by Gordon and the main deck crew, and so they're frustrated. They're yelling up at the hoist operator saying, stop, 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 reverse the winch. They're all waving and flagging this guy down. But the hoist operator, after he had hit start on the winch, had just kind of turned around because this is a routine thing they'd done a million times before. And so he's not looking at the crew on the main deck. So he has no idea what's going on. And it was so windy and loud that night on board the rig that he couldn't hear their cries. And so the winch just continued to reel in the wire, slowly raising Gordon closer and closer to the mouse hole. Now, Gordon could not get out of his harness unless he was on the platform below. 
So there was no way to escape the situation he was in. And so Gordon, after a few seconds of this not stopping and him continuing upward, he starts screaming. He's not annoyed anymore. He's terrified. And so is the crew on the main deck. They are now frantically screaming at the hoist operator to stop the winch, but nothing is working. And so one of the main deck crew members sensing that they need to do something different to get this guy's attention, he runs away from where the mouse hole is to this nearby phone. And this phone is connected up to the hoist operator station and he picks it up and it starts dialing. Up in the hoist operator station, he's still not paying attention when the phone rings. He grabs the phone, puts it to his ear, and immediately he's hit with screams to stop the winch. And so the hoist operator, totally confused, whips around and hits stop on the winch. But it was too late. Just a few moments earlier, Gordon had finally been pulled all the way up right to the entrance of the underside of this mouse hole. And as he reached this hole, he tried to position himself in a vertical position so that maybe he could slip his upper body into the hole and he could just kind of slide through the hole. He'd still be hurt by it, but it would limit the damage. However, because of his harness being on his waist right in front of him, he couldn't get himself into a vertical position. He could only lay back in a horizontal one. And so when he reached the underside of the main deck and he's looking right at this mouse hole, he just put his arms and his legs out and tried to push himself back as if he could fight the winch and keep himself from going into this hole. But there was nothing he could do. And so his pelvis first was pulled into the 10 inch hole. And as his body begins to literally break in half, he's screaming out in pain. And then by the time the hoist operator had hit stop, Gordon was already deceased and only a section of his torso actually made it up through the hole. Gordon's company was found guilty of being blatantly delinquent on many safety protocols, and so they were fined 60,000 pounds, and then they paid an undisclosed amount to Gordon's family. The next and final story, which is the top story of today's list, is called Boilermakers. At 7.20 p.m. on Friday, January 12, 2007, 19-year-old college freshman Wade Steffi walked into Ford Dining Hall, which is one of five dining halls on Purdue University's campus. Purdue is a prestigious American university located in Indiana that is known for its excellent athletics and academics. Wade, who was an aviation technology student and was at Purdue on a full academic scholarship, grabbed some food, and then sat down at a table with some friends. This was the first Friday of the 2007 spring semester, and so Wade and his friends at the table and the hundreds of other students that were sitting all around them were buzzing with excitement about what they were up to that night and what they were up to that weekend. And so Wade and his friends, they sat there chatting about their plans for about an hour, and then at around 8.20 p.m., Wade realized he needed to leave. And so he stood up, he said goodbye to his friends, he carried his tray to the trash can, and then he made his way out of the doors he came in on. And so once he was outside of the dining hall, he immediately turned right and walked the very short distance to the building that was right next to Ford Dining Hall. And so that building was called Owen Hall, and it was a dormitory. Now, this was not Wade's dormitory. He actually lived in a different dorm called Kerry Quad West, which was located on the other side of Ford Dining Hall. And so Wade goes inside of Owen Hall because he has some friends in there, and he makes his way to their room, and when he goes inside, he sees they're all kind of sitting around chatting and drinking some alcoholic drinks. And so Wade sits down, and he has a couple of drinks, and he just hangs out with his friends for about an hour. And so around 9.30 p.m., Wade and the other people he was with in this room, they left Owen Hall and they walked the half mile away from campus to the west to this huge party at a fraternity. And so Wade would stay at this fraternity for several hours until about midnight, at which point he pulled one of his friends aside and he told them that he just remembered he had left his jacket inside of Owen Hall and so he wanted to go back and retrieve it. The dorms on Purdue's campus all lock at night, and so the only way you can get inside is if you live there, and so you have a key. 
or if you know someone who lives there who will open the door for you. And so during his walk back to Owen Hall, Wade would make six phone calls in an attempt to get someone in Owen Hall to open the door for him. But four of his phone calls would just be the wrong number. And so the people that were picking up and he was asking to open the door, they didn't know what he was talking about. And so they hung up. But he did call two people that did live inside of Owen Hall. However, they didn't answer their phones. And so around 12.30 a.m., Wade arrived at Owen Hall. He put his phone back in his pocket and he just walked up to the doors, which were locked, and he just started knocking. And eventually, a resident of Owen Hall who didn't know Wade and Wade didn't know them, they heard the knocking and they came out to the door to see what was going on. And they looked through the glass and they saw Wade. And apparently, they decided that Wade looked too intoxicated to let into the building. And so they refused him entry. And so Wade apparently stood there. He kept knocking for a little bit, but he eventually just kind of gave up. He turned around and he walked away. Fast forward a few days to Tuesday, January 16th, and Wade's roommate, who had actually been gone all the past weekend, he returned, and the first thing he noticed when he got back to his dorm was that Wade was not in the dorm. And so he called and texted Wade, but he didn't get a response. And so the roommate went out around the floor that they lived on to ask people if they had seen Wade, and no one had seen him since the previous Friday. And so starting to get pretty concerned, the roommate called Wade's family to see if maybe they knew what was going on with him, but his family had no idea. And so by the end of that day, the police had been contacted about Wade potentially being missing, and they in turn contacted Wade's cell phone provider, and they were able to determine that Wade's cell phone was still showing up somewhere on Purdue's campus, although they couldn't figure out exactly where. So that evening, a massive campus-wide search was launched with hundreds of police officers and volunteers. Even the school's equestrian club came out with their horses to search the nearby woods. But despite this huge search effort that would go on for several weeks, the only thing they would find of Wade's was one of his shoes. It was found on January 20th, so just four days into the search, and it was located right outside of an exterior door that led into a maintenance room inside of Owen Hall. But when they searched this maintenance room, Wade wasn't in there. Finally, after nearly a month of searching, when they still had not found Wade, the official search was called off. On March 19th, roughly two months after Wade had been reported missing, a maintenance worker was downstairs in the laundry room of Owen Hall when they heard a strange popping sound. At first, the worker thought it was actually coming from one of the washers or dryers that was on, and you know, maybe there's a loose coin or some piece of metal that was inside of the washer or dryer that's getting banged around inside, and that's making the sound. And so this worker began walking around the laundry room, kind of listening in to each of the washers and dryers that were on to see if they were making this sound. And so as he's doing this, he hears the popping sound again, but it's clearly not coming from any of the washers and dryers. In fact, it's not even coming from inside the laundry room. It's coming from somewhere out in the hall. Curious, he leaves the laundry room and he goes out into the hall, and as soon as he's standing in the hall, he hears the popping sound again. And this time, it was obvious that it was coming from behind the closed door that was directly opposite the laundry room. So the worker pulled out his big set of keys, he opened the door that was directly in front of him, and he stepped inside. Moments later, he would make a big discovery. Based on that discovery and the investigation that would follow it, this is a reconstruction of what happened to Wade Steffi. In the early morning hours of January 13th, right after Wade had been denied entry into Owen Hall, because the student who was in there who didn't know him thought he was too intoxicated. Right after that happened, Wade left the front doors and made his way around to the left side of the building to look for another way inside. And when he got to the left side of the building, he found another door. Now, even though this door did not have a sign on it that said, keep out, it was fairly obvious that this door was not designed for students to use. There was a metal railing that lined the outside of this door, clearly to prevent pedestrians from getting to the door, and the door itself was actually not built at ground level. It basically was built at basement level, 
So you'd be standing at this railing, looking down at the door. And down in front of the door was a slab of cement right out in front of it that gave the door enough clearance to be able to open. And so basically there was a railing around a pit and that was where the door was. The proper way to get to this door was to literally climb over that railing and jump down into this pit. And then you'd need a key to open the door because it was always locked. Well, it was supposed to always be locked. And so when Wade saw this clearly off-limits door on the side of Owen Hall, in his drunken state, he decided it would be a good idea to try to go into it. Because in his mind, he thought, you know, whatever is behind this door doesn't really matter. As long as I can just get inside of some part of Owen Hall, I can find my way up to my friend's room and I can get my jacket. And so he rushes over to the railing, he climbs over, he leaps down into that pit area, he grabs the doorknob of this off-limits door and he pulls on it and it's open. And so he opens it up, he steps inside and it's totally pitch black. And all he can hear is the sound of machines humming and whirring in the darkness. And again, in his drunken state, he decides this is still a good idea. His only concern was he couldn't find a light switch and it really was basically pitch black in here. And he was worried once the door shut, not only would his only light source be totally cut off, but it might actually lock behind him and then he'd be trapped inside of this room. And so he took off one of his shoes and he tucked it in the door jam of the door he came in on to keep it open. And so with the door propped open behind him, he began walking into this room. And pretty much right away, he bumped into this big metal structure. He couldn't see what it was, because again, it was too dark, but he could feel it. And he could tell, you know, it was a flat metal structure. It felt like a machine of some kind. And he could hear that it was one of the machines that was buzzing and whirring. And so he just decided he would try to walk around it. Because again, his goal is just to get through this room and find another door somewhere and kind of continue his journey up into the dorm. And so Wade began moving his way left along this machine, kind of believing it was going to come to a stop at some point, And then he could walk around it. But it would turn out this machine was very big, very wide. And so by the time he actually got to the left edge of this machine, he was practically right up against the wall of the room he was in. And when he got there, he realized the space between the side of the machine and the wall of the room was big enough that if he turned sideways, he could basically squeeze his way past it. Now, he had no idea how far into the room this strange machine went, but in his drunken state, he decided it was a good idea. And so he turned sideways, so his back is to the wall of the room, and his chest is going to be facing the machine, and he begins pushing himself into that narrow space. And so as he's making his way, his hands are up, kind of protecting his face and neck, and at some point, he kind of begins to trip. Now, he didn't actually fall because he's basically wedged into this tight space. But for a second, he reflexively grabbed with his hands onto this machine right in front of him. And just by chance, his left ring finger slipped into a very narrow hole that was about two inches deep. The room that Wade was inside of was called an electrical vault, and it contained six large transformers, one of which Wade's finger had just stuck inside of. The job of these six transformers is to take the high voltage they receive from the main power grid and then transform it, hence the name, into lower usable voltage that gets dispersed into Owen Hall for residents and teachers. Even though the outside of these transformers had mostly been covered with protective materials that mitigated the electrocution risk, there were still several parts of these machines that there was just nothing you could do. They just presented a really high electrocution risk. And one of those sections you needed to be extra careful with was that two inch hole that Wade's finger slipped inside of. At the back of that hole was an exposed electrical conductor. And the second the tip of his finger touched that conductor, between 2,000 and 4,000 volts of electricity were pumped into his body. For reference, when people get executed via the electric chair, they are electrocuted with 2,000 volts of electricity. Wade likely died instantly, but because of the fact that he was kind of wedged between the transformer and the wall, after he died, he didn't just slump onto the ground, 
Instead, he remained in a semi-upright position with his finger still stuck inside of that hole. And so for the next two months, his body just continued to be electrocuted every second. Finally, sometime in March, as a result of Wade's body fluids draining out of him, the electrical current that was being pumped into him altered its course and began snapping outside of his skin into the ground. And so the sound of the electrical current actually striking the ground was that popping sound that the maintenance worker heard. The door that the maintenance worker opened in order to investigate the sound was the only other door that led into the electrical vault, the other being the exterior door that Wade had gone in on. Initially, when the worker opened that door and looked inside of the vault, he actually didn't see Wade, but he smelled something funny, and that was what led him to walk into the room and make his way around, and that's when he spotted Wade's body. Earlier, on January 20th, when they found Wade's shoe, which at some point had just slipped out of the door jamb, so it was not propping open the exterior door when it was found, it was just sitting in that pit area, and the exterior door was shut. And so when they found that shoe, the police, they did go inside of the electrical vault, but they didn't go in through the exterior door. They went around and went in the same door that the maintenance worker opened from right across the hall from the laundry room. And when they opened it up, they just looked into the room. They didn't walk into the room, they just looked from the doorway, and from their perspective, they couldn't see Wade. And so that was why initially they had said, you know, Wade is not inside of that room. Ultimately, because that exterior door to the electrical vault was supposed to be locked at all times, and clearly it was not because that's how Wade got in, Purdue was found to be negligent, and so they agreed to pay Wade's family $500,000, and they also set up a scholarship in Wade's name. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the five star review button has an itch on their back, offer to scratch it for them, but continuously misunderstand their directions so you never actually itch the right spot. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crimes. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So, that's gonna do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.